great speakers and topics that we're going to cover, and I'll give you just a brief kind of outline of how the session is going to work. Um, <clears throat> we have three speakers, um, and depending on whether or not the speakers leave time for questions at the end, we'll take questions for the individual speakers. Uh, and then we're going to actually have a panel discussion, so at the end, I'll invite all of the speakers back up and we'll have a panel discussion session um, for translocation kind of as a whole. So there should be plenty of time for discussion and questions today. Um, so we have some really great speakers. Um, we've got Brian McElroy, he's the Pacific Lamprey Project Leader for the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. Tori Wakelin is an aquatic biologist for the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. And then John Hess is a fishery scientist for the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. So I'm really excited to hear what everyone has to say today. Um, I wanted to start the translocation session. I just didn't feel it was appropriate to moderate a translocation session without giving a nod to Mr. Elmer Crow. Um, Elmer was a mentor to me like I'm sure he was to many people in this room. And I just wanted to share a quick story about Elmer. I invited Elmer to come down to Cow Creek to talk with our people about the translocation work that Nez Perce was doing and also talk about the cultural significance of lamprey to his people. And we had many conversations prior to him coming down. And in one of our conversations, he asked me, so, Am I going to meet other people from your aquatic staff when I'm up there? And I said, you're talking to her. And he said, oh, okay. And he left it at that, and I didn't really think much of it. Well, he got to Cow Creek, and he hands me this picture that he had printed out. And I said, thank you so much. What is it? And he said, this is a picture of our aquatics program meeting from last week. And I think there must have been 70 people <laughs> in this picture. And he said, that's why I asked you if I was going to meet other people from your aquatic staff. And I said, wow, if I had 70 people on my aquatic staff, the amount I could accomplish. And he smiled and he patted me on the shoulder and gave me that Elmer look. And he said, you know, we didn't always have that many people in our program. It took a lot of hard work and dedication. He said, but you'll get there. You'll get there one day. And I said, thanks. And those words have really stuck with me over the years. And they're pretty applicable to a lot of situations. And I couldn't help but think that it's really applicable to why we're all here this week, the biggest gathering of lamprey nerds in the country. <laughs> and I just want to start the session off by saying, with hard work and dedication, we'll get there, and we'll bring back our brother Eel. So, with that, I would like to introduce Brian McElroy, who is going to be presenting on um, the Pacific Lamprey restoration efforts in the Columbia Basin on behalf of the Kritvik member tribes, which are the Yakima Nation, Umatilla Tribe, and Nez Perce Tribes. Thanks, Kelly and Christina. Welcome back to Critvik. Where's Ralph at? Did he take off? Oh, gee, Ralph, I'm sure had a nice bubble bath <laughs> this morning. He's ready, ready to roll. Uh, I've got my Seahawk screen uh, laser pointer, so that's a good start. Um, just uh, 
Welcome back. My name is Brian Mountgrave. I'm the Pacific Lamprey Project Leader with the Columbia River Intertribal uh, Fish Commission. And I'm going to talk sort of on behalf of the uh, cryptic member tribes that are utilized in translocation as part of their restoration uh, efforts. Um, my job at CRITFIC is to implement the Tribal Pacific Lamprey Restoration Plan on behalf of the CRITFIC member tribes. Uh, CRITFIC itself is a, a group that was put together in the late 70s to help um, lobby for treaty fishing access as well as the improvement of salmon returns and other culturally important fish species of which lamprey are a part of that. Uh, lamprey declines were highlighted, highlighted by the tribes in the, in the 90s and that's probably one of the reasons why we're here today talking about lamprey is due to the, the efforts of the, the um, tribes highlighting this decline and trying to figure out why the heck um, we've lost so many fish uh, within the Columbia River Basin and, and elsewhere uh, within the range of Pacific lamprey. So I've got some, some basic goals with this talk. I'm going to try to keep it relatively short so we've got lots of time for questions and discussions. Um, I, don't, I know just enough to be dangerous for the uh, translocation uh, programs. There's a lot of really intricate results that um, we can talk about, but the, the tribal uh, project leaders, most of them are here today, so hopefully if there's specific questions, they, they can help answer uh, those questions as well. So I just want to do a couple things here. I want to highlight the basic background and rationale for the CRITFIC member tribe uh, projects, uh, translocation projects, describe the basic uh, components of these, these projects that are uh, ubiquitous between the three tribal programs, and then compare and contrast to some of the, the basics of the individual tribal programs, and then if we have time, uh, go into, to, into some results, or we can save that time for, for questions. So we, it's interesting that I, I only saw one passage slide, the historical pass, passage um, uh, slide from Bonneville down. Uh, usually that's one that gets recycled in, it, in every talk, but I, I think that's a good thing because we folks know that uh, lamprey have declined uh, dramatically within the Columbia River Basin, so we don't need to, to dwell too much on that, but I think it's important to know that um, the tribes noticed this decline in the early uh, 90s and 2000s and highlighted this decline and, and decided, made, or began making lamprey restoration a part of their everyday work and, and, and bringing that issue to the state and federal agencies that they, they wanted to see improved lamprey returns within the uh, Columbia River Basin. And so when they saw these declines, the, 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 the consequences of these declines were a number of things. A decreased ecological ne connectivity of a native fish species, so that fish was, was starting to, to peter out. Uh, local and regional extirpations, especially within the interior portions of, the, of their range. And then also, maybe most importantly, uh, a loss of cultural connection. So you're not seeing lamprey within your seeded area streams, you're not connecting to that fish, you're not handling that fish anymore, and you start losing that institutional memory of, of that, that fish species, and that's a really important uh, point, something that all four of the member tribe uh, programs are uh, predicated on is, is connection of the fish to the, to the tribal people. And so the tribes had a couple of options when they, they saw these declines. They could basically do nothing and just kind of let things work themselves out on their own. They could identify and address uh, threats within the main stem and then sort of allow natural returns and recolonization to occur. Or they could take a more proactive approach and address existing threats, identify threats, and then also develop proactive uh, measures for uh, restoration. Learn by doing, let the fish teach you what's going on within the system. And that's hard to do when you have no fish. And so as a result of that, in the early 2000s, the Umatilla tribe began a, developing a restoration plan that included translocation as a component uh, of that. So when we're talking about translocation here, we're talking about uh, taking fish, uh, 
move, the movement of wild caught fish from one place to another. In this case, it's adult Pacific lamprey from the main stem of the Columbia River Basin and putting those fish into high value, high quality spawning habitats uh, within the uh, upper and middle uh, uh, streams within the Columbia River Basin. And the, the translocation tribes, they had some, some pretty simple goals. They wanted to, to guarantee that some adults were able to, to bypass the difficult migration corridor that existed within the Columbia River Basin and get into these uh, potential spawning habitats and that those fish would um, spawn and we would see an increase in larval distribution and then eventually an increase in uh, juvenile outmigration. Those fish contributing to the, the, the greater uh, population of lamprey with the hope that those fish could return either to the Columbia River Basin or somewhere else within the range of Pacific lamprey and, and jumpstart this uh, feedback loop uh, that we think is uh, a part of the lamprey life history. So I just wanted to orient you to the, the, the three tribes that are conducting uh, translocation, yeah, yeah, excuse me, the Yakima, the Umatilla and the Nez Perce tribes, and all these tribes, their seeded areas, seeded areas are three to four dams upstream within the basin, so there's quite a few obstacles for adult lamprey to get from the ocean to, uh, back to these uh, seeded areas. The exception is uh, Warm Springs tribe down here. They're relatively low within the basin. They've had uh, moderately successful returns, and so as a result, their program has really been focused on maintaining those populations and learning more about those populations. So I'm not trying to ignore Warm Springs within this talk, I'm just talking about the translocation tribes. Um, all four member tribes have a lamprey program. Uh, three have chosen to utilize translocation as a way to, to restore uh, lamprey there. So as mentioned, the Umatilla tribe, they began their translocation program in 2000, and the Nez Perce and Yakima tribes followed suit in the in 2007-2008, developing their translocation programs. It was at that at that time that the, the Critvik Commission, which meets in this uh, room actually monthly, decided that they needed to develop some sort of guidelines for collection uh, to, um, among among other things, just ma maintain a, uh, communication between the member tribes, so that that all four tribes knew where fish were coming from and where those fish were, were going. So they developed these guidelines for translocation, which are within the Tribal Pacific Lamprey Restoration Plan, uh, which is on the Critvik uh, website. And I won't go into lots of detail with it. I'll just talk about the, the basic idea, is to collect adult lamprey near release streams, as, cl as close to those release streams as possible, but also maximize the collection of adults that are going to be delayed or blocked at uh, main stem dams. Um, develop some sort of metric that helps limit the percentage of lamprey collected in any, any one year so that you're not collecting you know, the entire run of lamprey at Bonneville Dam. For example, you've got some constraints there. And then also built into those guidelines are communication uh, protocols so that they're, they're all four member tribes are clear on how many fish are being collected, where those fish are going, and then a summarization of, of what occurred. So the basic components of, of translocation, I'm going to talk about these in general. And these are generally uh, applicable to all three of the, the tra translocation tribes. There are some, some tweaks, and if we get questions later, we can go into those uh, specifics. But adult lamprey are collected uh, at Bonneville, the Dalles, and John Day dams uh, from May through October. And, and the collection is guided by the tribal guidelines for translocation. And this is a, a chart just summarizing all the collection that has occurred since 2010, which is about when the tribal guideline, guidelines were being used. The basic take home message here is that um, collection has increased since 2010, um, and that tribal, individual tribal collection has ranged anywhere from zero to about 1,200 adult lamprey being collected. So the most lamprey that have been collected in any one year is the most recent year, 2017. You're looking at 1,200 
uh, fish collected by each member tribe in general, and that a majority of the fish in any year are, are uh, percentage-wise are collected at the Dalles uh, Dam, which is just a combination of uh, accessibility at that location and just the way that the guidelines are, are set up um, creates a situation where uh, the Dalles tends to be a place where we're able to get the most fish. Fish are then uh, transport and held at tribal over uh, tribal facilities and overwintered. So adults that are collected in 2017 will be overwintered and they'll be released in the spring of 2018. And Mary Mosier talked about some of the experiments that they've done to improve the holding and maturation um, of, of those fish, uh, which is something I hadn't heard before, so that was cool to see. So there are, the tribes are always tweaking um, ways to make the protocols uh, better. <coughs> and then these fish are released from April through July to, to uh, seeded areas. The, the idea that is that you hold fish until they're ready to spawn, and then you release these fish right before that time frame to maximize the probability that those fish are going to spawn and, and, uh, and create uh, progeny. There are some uh, variations in that. I think the Yakimas have an early release and a late release, and if we have some time, Ralph can, can go into details uh, on that. Just to give you a sense of uh, geography, again, we're looking at the uh, Columbia River Basin. We've got Portland down here. And the Yakimas are releasing fish primarily into the Yakima River, but have also released fish in the Wenatchee and Metau Rivers. Umatilla into the Umatilla tribe into primarily the Umatilla River. And then the Nez Perce into the Snake River Basin and the uh, Clearwater River Basin and, and tributaries within those those sub-basins. And once fish are released, or even during the collection piece, there's a whole slew of monitoring and evaluation uh, that occurs, and I won't go into lots of detail here, but basically every stage of that process of collection to release and even after release is monitored in some way, and that information is really provided um, a, a lot of, uh, it's really helped not only monitor the translocation program, but improved our understanding of, of Pacific lamprey, just the basic life history of the fish has been able to be occurred, uh, to occur uh, because of these efforts. So I'm just going to briefly talk about the three um, tribes and their, their programs uh, individually. And um, I didn't want to go into too much detail. I didn't want to save time, time for questions. And if we have time, then we'll go into to more detail. But the Umatilla tribe, again, their program in the early 2000s, they were noticing extra, essentially extirpated populations within the Umatilla River, and this was a combination, they think, of poor passage in the main stem, as well as targeted eradication of lamprey within the Umatilla River. And so they, they wanted to utilize translocation to uh, basically jumpstart the restoration efforts within the Umatilla River. They felt like, if you don't have fish in a river, how, how are you supposed to identify other limiting uh, factors in that? Uh, location, and they, their their goals were to uh, um, reestablish this cultural connection to the fish, uh, maintain some presence of lamprey within their seeded areas, with the goal that that would uh, create a scenario where more, more adults would be returning to their uh, seeded areas, um, just based on the, the pheromone um, return um, mechanism that we haven't talked too much about here today. Their numbers have primarily been released into the Umatilla Basin. So you can see all the releases for the uh, Umatilla tribe here from 2000 until 2016. It's varied from year to year. It's primarily been in the Umatilla sub-basin. But they have recently re released fish into the Grand Ronde uh, Basin. So that gives you a sense of, of location as well as uh, numbers of fish being released. And from their translocation programs, they, they helped develop the guidelines for, for the collection guidelines for adult lamprey, as well as develop successful collection transport and holding techniques. So just getting, safely getting fish from point A to point B. And then through their monitoring efforts, they've observed adult spawning, both uh, visually but also um, 
confirm that with egg viability tests. They've seen increased larval distribution, abundance, and outmigration within the Umatilla River, and, and more recently they've seen increased adult returns to the Umatilla River. They were seeing, um, you know, less than 10 fish in the early 2000s, and I think this year or last year they saw uh, 600 fish returning to, to the Umatilla River, which is really great uh, to see. You can see this. This picture here, maybe not in the back, you can see this, but this is uh, those are juvenile lamprey collected in the screw trap on the Umatilla River. And Aaron Jackson um, uh, believes that there's about 1,500 adult or adult juvenile lamprey in this this net. And they, um, this, I think it was last year they were getting buckets and buckets of about migrating juvenile uh, lamprey, which is uh, sounds like a, a ton of work, but it's it's cool to to see that um, that picture because you know those fish are are hopefully going to contribute to the overall population. Next on to the Yakima tribe. So the tribe, the Yakima tribe began their program in 2000, or uh, started releasing fish in uh, 2011, and they had the same basic goals. They wanted to maintain a connection to the, the fish and restore uh, lamprey populations within their seeded areas and, and establish an ecological connection again between the, the ocean and the Yakima uh, seeded areas. And ultimately, the goals of, of all these tribal translocation programs and, and their land for restoration programs in general is not only to have fish returning, but returning in numbers uh, that allow for harvestable populations uh, for uh, tribal members. If you can get to that point, then you're, you're probably doing something right. The Yakimas have focused their effort on the, the uh, Yakima River and the uh, tributaries within that system, so a couple hundred fish, uh, or more than a couple hundred fish every year going into the Yakima, and then more recently, uh, hundreds of fish being released into the Metau and Wenatchee rivers, so those are upper Columbia um, streams, and so there's been a shift in focus there as they are able to gather more fish, improve their methods, and also reevaluate where they, they want to put uh, a fish for for various reasons. The Yakima have also seen increased larval distribution, abundance and outmigration, as well as increased adult returns to the Yakima River. And they've also been able to utilize uh, translocated adults as well as uh, outmigrating juveniles uh, because of the translocations to evaluate passage issues. Uh, again, we go back to that scenario where you have no fish, it's hard to identify uh, problems if, if you don't have a fish to study and so having fish in the river both adults and juveniles has really helped them understand what's going on within their their basins and identified solutions that can help uh, fix those problems and then Ralph also uh, in the session yesterday talked a lot about the art research and development of artificial propagation and the translocation program has helped um, get that that going they've been able to collect fish and then use those fish for artificial propagation, which has um, really helped, um, will, has helped and will help in the future. Finally, the Nez Perce tribe, they're way the heck up in the system. There's eight dams in between them and the, uh, and, uh, the ocean. And so they're really just trying to maintain some presence of lamprey within their seeded areas while passage is improved and addressed at all those, those eight projects. Um, there's, there's a high quality habitat up there. They just need to get fish there and then work um, sort of backwards, uh, improving passage to get fish at, that, at that, that spot. So they've released anywhere from a couple hundred fish to more recently 500 fish into various streams within the Snake and Salmon and Clearwater um, river basins. And just a brief summary of, of this first, they've also as, as in the Umatilla and Yakima tribes, have seen spawning behavior of tra translocated adults, and this has been confirmed through uh, genetic monitoring, which I think John Hess will touch on uh, later today. They've seen increased larval distribution, abundance, and outmigration within their streams, and uh, have shown the translocated adults have successfully uh, produced progeny in, in all their, their translocation streams. So just to kind of circle back to the initial goals of the translocation programs. They wanted to sort of maintain or reestablish a, 
uh, uh, ecological and cultural connection of lamprey within their their seeded areas. They wanted to guarantee that that some of those lamprey that they're collecting are able to, to get to spawning habitat, as well as increase larval distribution, out migration, with the goal of not only contributing to the population of lamprey overall, but also maintain some sort of connection for upstream migrating adults to go into these streams. So, um, gonna get, getting back to that pheromone cue uh, aspect. And they've been relatively successful at, at all these, um, these goals. Of course, they're always constantly improving their, their techniques. Uh, new um, threats occur. And, and so, um, but, but having fish in the river, both adults, um, translocated adults, but then also the progeny of those adults has really helped identify uh, other issues within those, those areas and allow the tribes to um, uh, continue to improve uh, life uh, for those fish and, and improve, um, hopefully, the, the uh, help restore lamprey. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. I kept it very high level. Um, hopefully, we've got lots of time for questions. And if we want to get down into the nitty gritty, then we can certainly do that. Thanks. Yeah, we've got some time for some questions for Brian. Um, Christina's going to walk around with the microphone so folks can hear. Brian, nice job. Um, this is, I'm not sure if you're able to answer this question. It touches on translocation and a little bit of other stuff, but I'm curious what uh, the tribes and Crit Fix view is of translocation as a vehicle for possible mitigation of climate change, or I don't know if that's something you can touch on, but... Um, yeah, I'm just going to be kind of waving my hands here, but I think that, you know, what I know about climate change, the, um, you know, the upper uh, portions of the range appear to be the, the, the important pieces. They've got the cold water, uh, refugia, and that kind of thing. We, we're just beginning to learn about the basics of sort of the thermal tolerances and lamprey, I mean, they've survived a lot of stuff. And so my guess is that they, um, they may be more adaptable to changes in, in temperature. I think that's something that we're just beginning to sort of converge on, these big picture ideas of, of climate change and um, uh, you know, piecing our restoration efforts in, into that. My guess is that um, the information that we're using or developing with the translocation can, can be inserted into those types of efforts. And if there are strongholds or places that we think that will be safe for lamprey and they're not there and there's good habitat there, then possibly translocation could be used to, to uh, reestablish populations in those locations for long-term um, restoration. Thanks. Yeah, I had a kind of a comment about that because, um, the, for example, in 2015 when we had really warm water temperatures in the tributaries, I know the Umatilla tribe actually used the translocation program in a way to um, rescue lamprey in, uh, in the river when it was um, just dried up and hot and they were actually holding fish at, um, in a facility that had a cold water source and so I, I think Ben's comment is really uh, appropriate because it is kind of a refuge situation where you're pulling them out during really hot um, summertime temperatures and potentially holding them in a safe water temperature um, particularly in those years when you have a really dire tributary situation. And I would just add too that the, the protocols and the techniques for collection and holding I think it helped with that because you're able, they know how to um, trap lamprey, hold lamprey safely, um, keep them in a location for, for later release. So you're not having to learn that stuff on the fly. They've kind of got that figured out. 
trapping, finding those fish can be difficult, trapping them, so. Uh, you know, Water Springs um, <clears throat> basically has an abundance of uh, lamprey in their area, and it's always been so. And uh, without so much as us, uh, I guess, uh, interfering with their life cycle and maintaining uh, the food sources and everything else that uh, uh, eels have in the rivers. And like I said before, you guys, when you guys start studying something, study them, but study them from afar and watch how they live and watch how what is, you know, uh, uh, happening during their lifestyle, not assuming this is what should happen, not assuming they're warm water or cold water uh, species, because you don't know. Maybe there's a Goldilocks zone that they live in and thrive more, and yet you try to put them in an area where they were there, but not in great numbers, and you try to change Mother Nature. You know, we have um, harvests, a lot of harvests, whether it be in Willamette or Willamette River System or uh, Columbia River System or uh, Deschutes River System, John Day. Uh, Warm Springs has always harvested a lot. And we were basically a trade center for other tribes long ago. And, and that should also tell you something that why were they trading during that time in pre-contact uh, along with the uh, early contact days that uh, we had bundles set up a certain way uh, whether it be five eels or ten eels or twenty eels per bundle uh, for trading and there was a purpose behind that so you guys want to look at the historical side of it also yeah, there was eels all over. There was eels uh, here and there. And then when you start putting numbers in, like I said before, to uh, assume there was just big population here, a big population there, yeah, over the years maybe. But, you know, you really got to look at the historical, how we look at it, you know, where uh, the eels are and how they were. We never interfered with their way of life but assuming that they would go on because of the rivers that was there and the food systems that was in these rivers. And uh, when I'm talking about food systems, I'm talking about uh, when the salmon uh, died after spawning and their bodies were in the water, created uh, little food systems in their little sand beds and everything else that they lived in. And when we try to create something that's in a tray and put them in a tray instead of where they originally belong and learn how to feed. You know, we're, uh, what are we creating? You know, we need to have them in their natural environment, their sand beds and everything else as they go along. So that's just a thought. It's not a more of a question, but a statement, you know, that I have, you know, that uh, Indian people went all over to collect eels, all over to dry eels. And, you know, like I said, at a certain time, and we still haven't lost that ability <clears throat> while we're still here to recognize these places to where we go or used to go. And today it's a lot different when you try to go harvest someplace that <clears throat> years before it used to be our area of harvest for lamprey. And uh, I'm talking about like Rogue River, you know, Winchester Dam, um, all those places along here in the Willamette system, Detroit Dam, that kind of basically <laughs> got destroyed by um, progress of civilization. But you look at the trade issues and um, welcoming by other tribes, you know, like in Smith River, you know, they used to, we, our people used to go down for religious services down there at the churches and stuff, and then always get invited out as young, younger people to partake in their uh, hooking of the eels in the uh, stream as they're coming in from the ocean. It just, um, you know, <clears throat> you need to kind of look at that history 
on that part of that lifestyle of, of the lamprey and gathering and stuff and how how it occurred and why why it was doing that. Like I said before, when early settlers came here, they watched the native people and what they were doing and how they were doing, and then in turn learned how to approach this country, how to live in this country. When your settlers first came here, their people were dying. If it wasn't for the native people supplying them with things and showing them at that time, they, you know, learned to live in this country. It was a supermarket to us, but a deadly place to people that didn't know how to live in this country. So you want to take that in lesson on how this country is and how it prepares its things that's in there to live in this kind of country. Learn from that why this eel survived here, why this salmon survived here, you know, why did these native people survive here, and how did they survive here. Not trying to put a study on them to say, this is how you should have been surviving. This is how you should be doing. This is what we need to do to correct the eel's demise from extinction. We don't know, it might be a cycle, maybe a hundred year to a hundred year cycle. Then all of a sudden it might be coming back a lot. And what if we interfere at the wrong time? What's going to happen? You're going to actually eradicate the lamprey. So you guys want to be careful when you start looking at our food system and food sources and look at the native people's, uh, how do you say it, um, I don't know how you say the word, but anyway, you look at the native people, oh, aspect of how we look at them and how we learn how to harvest them and when. You know, that's, that's what this is all about to me, that we sit here and listen and we listen to you guys talk. You guys are got good minds, good hearts, good um, things towards this on helping achieve things and putting that lamprey back in his place in his in this world to where he will filter the water and he shows us this is wrong. There's something wrong here. I'm disappearing, you know, like that. Use that as guidelines, same way you use the salmon, uh, deer, or elk, or mink, or whatever. Learn to look at Mother Nature and their signs. That's how we did. That's how our signs evolved over the 30, 40,000 years that our people have evolved that scientific knowledge on food gathering and protection of the resource and the explanation of why and how the Creator put us down to take care of these animals that were taking care of us. And our, in our return, we had to take care of them. So you guys want to remember that when you guys do all your scientific studies and everything else and look and see that kind of intention that is there and what good intentions you have or what intentions you may have, how would it affect this, my grandchildren, your grandchildren, 30, 40 years from now. That's what you need to look at. Don't change things that's in the river. You know, build it up and then work at that. Thank you. Yeah, time to respond real quick. I just real quick, I just want to respond that, so within the tribal restoration guidelines uh, built in into that, um, there's supposed to be an effort of identifying through uh, oral traditions and tribal stories and interviews with elders of where those fish were historically so that when we're, when the tr uh, translocation tribes are putting fish back, they're putting them in locations where lamprey uh, were. And then the, the second um, response was that, yeah, we, I think the uh, member tribes, all four member tribes, even the translocation tribes, would, would prefer to have lamprey uh, within their, their areas to, to uh, monitor rather than having to move them from, from point A to point B, but that's just not the reality right now. And so uh, it does help to have fish in the river so that you can identify uh, the, 
problems. It's just hard when there's no lamprey there. So, thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Brian. Um, if there are additional questions for Brian, we'll take them during the panel discussion. But right now, I'd like to invite uh, Tori Wakeland um, from the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde to come up. He's going to be presenting today on the Fall Creek Pacific Lamprey Translocation Study. Uh, for sticking around this morning, looks like we're kind of dwindling in numbers a little bit, but I appreciate those who uh, stayed to uh, listen to this translocation uh, bit. Um, so I'm Tori Wakeland. I'm the lead aquatic biologist for the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, and we've been conducting a translocation study. <clears throat> and I was going to give you uh, kind of a quick background on the study itself and just kind of give you uh, an up-to-date um, on what's going on now. This study is still in progress. We still have a few more years that we're translocating and, and going to be doing uh, monitoring and things. So this is more just a status update. It looks like this uh, picture has been quite popular in a lot of people's uh, presentations this year. But uh, this is a picture from Willamette Falls here. Um, so uh, in decades past, uh, uh, lamprey were quite abundant in Willamette Valley. As you can see through this picture, and, and harvesting was uh, quite readily available for, for tribal members. Um, but over the last few decades, uh, there's been a significant decline in, in lamprey populations, which has then proven to be difficult uh, for tribal harvest, for our peoples to harvest, as well as uh, harvest locations have also diminished. Um, so it's the rebound of the population that the tribe has been most interested in, um, and that led us into some uh, telemetry studies to figure out where these fish are going, uh, what portions of the river systems they're using, which then ultimately led us into our uh, translocation pilot study. So in uh, 2013, we initiated this, and this was initially just going to, uh, well, I guess the first year was just to see if we could do it feasibly, logistically, if we could pull this off, if, if we had the time, the manpower, um, you know, just logistically if this was something that we could do. And our goal was to reintroduce uh, adult lamprey to historic spotting habitat. So our first, uh, uh, goal that we set out on there was just trying to locate an area that was uh, suitable, had suitable habitat, and met some uh, some initial uh, considerations. Um, so initially, uh, this is Fall Creek Dam, Fall Creek Reservoir. Um, we had kind of uh, fallen on this location for a few different reasons. Um, after looking into it, uh, we decided Fall Creek as a case study area would be an ideal study area for a few different reasons, one of which being uh, high quality historic spawning habitat. Uh, they also do an annual drawdown each year, um, which we figured would help with uh, out-migration of macrothalmia. Um, it's likely that adults already utilize the area below the dam, um, so if the, uh, uh, the pheromone uh, response was there, there's uh, adult lamprey to respond to that. Uh, the passage potential <coughs> was potentially low cost, it would require minimum modifications to the facility, and they could do a truck and haul from their catch facility if for uh, in-migrating adults. Um, and if this did prove to be successful, it did have good application other where, uh, elsewhere on other dams. So some initial considerations we took um, about the site is uh, um, Warbrook lamprey known to exist both above and below the dam, um, Pacific were likely to exist below the dam, but not necessarily above the dam. And Pacific, uh, we, so we decided to do Pacific Amosate surveys above and below the dam just to kind of confirm those, those considerations that we had taken into account. So before the translocation study started, um, we did some Amosate surveys at eight different sites, seven above the dam and one below the dam. In our initial surveys, this was assisted uh, by staff from Oregon State University. Um, we tested seven sites above the dam and identified 578 brook lamprey amicids above the dam and zero Pacific lamprey amicids above the dam. Below the dam, we tested one site. Uh, didn't get any brook 
lamprey amicetes, but we were able to identify 23 percent amicetes. Um, now that was only one site that we tested below the dam, but just the fact that we found Pacifics below the dam and not above the dam kind of confirmed what we had thought is that the, the population had been extirpated above the dam. So then we went into uh, the translocation project it's, itself. So the, the meat and bones of the translocation project here is to catch, capture adult lamprey from Willamette Falls and transport them to Fall Creek via truck. Um, we we're going to release them there. Um, successful Pacific lamprey reproduction above the dam was one goal, as well as to determine if uh, juvenile pheromones presence will cause adult lamprey to approach the dam and essentially into the uh, catch facility where they can be trucked and hauled above the dam. Let's give you an idea of what we're talking about here. Uh, we got Willamette Falls in the northern end there and Fall Creek in the southern end there, so we'd be picking up uh, Pacific lamprey from Willamette Falls and taking them down to Fall Creek to be released. The process in which we do that, uh, we access the falls by boat from downstream, so this is us coming upstream, uh, we moor to some rocks up there and then uh, make our way across the base of the falls, across the rocks here to collect the lamprey. Once we reach the base of the falls, the lamprey are connected, collected by hand and placed into five gallon buckets. From there, we take the five gallon buckets and we take them back to our boat where we have a cooler set up with an aeration system as well as a YSI monitoring system to monitor uh, dissolved oxygen and water temperature and things to make sure that they're in, in good hands while they're in the uh, cooler there on the boat. From the boat, they're transported to the marina where we have a truck awaiting with a large insulated tote, again with an aerator attached with a YSI system to monitor temperature and dissolved oxygen during the transport process. Give an idea of what we're looking at to make sure that, that they were in good hands while they are being in the in the translocation process during the actual movement. Again, like I said, we monitor dissolved oxygen and temperature. Uh, with the insulated tote, you can see that the temperature stayed uh, stable throughout the throughout the translocation process, and the dissolved oxygen stayed within a in a healthy range for the species. Um, at the end there, you can see where the temperature and the dissolved oxygen fall out. I just wanted to note that's just when we removed the YSI uh, probe from the tote, so that it's not some sort of catastrophic fall off there. So uh, here's the first batch of lamprey on our very first trip. This would have been 2013, arriving to Fall Creek. And then our first Pacific lamprey, lamprey release. So this would be the first adult Pacific lamprey that would have swam above the Fall Creek Dam in over 50 years uh, since the extirpation of the population there. Our first run in 2013, we moved 240 translocated adults in five separate trips. These trips occurred between August and September of 2013. The initial translocation process, we did not mark or tag or sample, or I guess we did do genetic samples, but we didn't mark or tag um, any of the, the adults that were translocated that year, we just wanted to be able to see if feasibly we could move them there, um, which we were able to do so. So this moves us into our actual, or, so now uh, post-translocation, uh, uh, we know that Brook Amicetes pr were present above the dam, and we're going to continue to do uh, Pacific Amicete surveys above the dam and below the dam, and we still have opportunity at that point to document dam seats above the dam now that we've translocated. So that was, that was initially done in, in fall of 2013 where we translocated them there. In spring of 2014 we did an initial uh, spawning survey. Reds were detected and we did find some spawned out adults. So we know that they had spawned there even within that first, you know, five, six months of them being translocated there. So to move out of the pilot study and into the bulk of the study, in 2014, we plan to translocate the same number of 240 adult lamprey. The way we came on that number is we figured about 240 would be good enough, or 200 would be good enough to seed the, the stream system with amicetes, or with uh, uh, reds and, and eggs and things of that nature. And then we wanted to be able to pit tag 40 of them to monitor their movements. But we didn't want that any potential mortality to affect that 200 number. So we had 200 translocated with an additional 40 pit tags, so we're not affecting that 200 number that we we're looking for. 
Um, we established fixed telemetry receiver sites at the dam, and then we complemented that with mobile tracking um, to do uh, pre-spawning mortality of areas of use. We, uh, we did monitoring there, collected genetics on these guys uh, when we translocated them, and we're conducting spawning surveys each uh, spring. The study is supposed to go for one full life cycle. That's seven years, and we're continuing translocation each year. So this was the first uh, uh, translocation or the pit tagging where we were monitoring them. Uh, the one drop site there, we had dropped 60 lamprey, 10 of which were tagged. The other drop site, we had 108 80 lamprey dropped with 30 of them tagged. During our mobile, uh, our mobile telemetry surveys, we were trying to see how they distributed themselves throughout the stream system. If you can see here, the two drop sites are down kind of on the, southern, on the lower end of the stream system and they did spread themselves out across the stream system, one of which actually moving 10 miles up from the initial drop site. So they did take advantage of the stream systems, and they dispersed themselves quite readily. So to get into uh, where we are today, that same process has taken place in 2015, 2016, and 2017. Each year we did spawning surveys, reds have been uh, observed. In 2015 and 2017, Adult lamprey had uh, returned to the catch facility at Fall Creek Reservoir. Um, 2016, just to note, lamprey traps weren't deployed due to high water levels, so there could have been some that returned in 2016, though we don't have a way to document that. Uh, additionally, we have observed uh, Pacific lamprey amicetes and mac macrothalmia out migration. So to get into that a little bit more, um, in 2017, this would have been the first year that we felt confident that the amicetes would have been in a a stage where we could positively identify them from Brooklyn Prep. So uh, there were some issues with water as well as the Jones fire in the area restricted access, but we were able to get in for two days and do some electroshocking. Uh, 41 Pacific lamprey were uh, identified as well as 32 Brooklyn lamprey detected. So we have a picture there showing the, you know, the in comparison the Brooklyn lamprey and the Pacific lamprey. Um, so we were excited about that. We know that they had reproduced. We know they have good uh, rearing habitat now. Um, in addition, as I was preparing for this uh, presentation, I was kind of worried about the uh, macrothalmia portion, but just here within the last week or so, we got confirmation from uh, biologists at the uh, Fall Creek Dam that they have been getting Pacific lamprey macrothalmia in their screw traps below the dam, as well as in the elevator system within the dam that allows for passage. Um, so that's quite promising for us shows that uh, not only did they reproduce, the rearing habitat was good enough, and uh, the passage is, is adequate that they're actually being able to make it through the dam and uh, continue out migration. So our lessons learned here is uh, we tackled a few things. Uh, logistically, it was feasible to translocate, which is one of the things that we were trying to do. We were trying to show that uh, adults could survive in, in preferred habitat where they had been extirpated from via translocation. Um, we showed spawning success and rearing success with our amicete surveys and our spawning ground surveys. And then with the macrothalmia outmigration, we've shown that the outmigrate or the passage allows for outmigration of juveniles, as well as the catch facility can facilitate upstream migration of adults as they come into the catch facility. They can be truck and hauled above the uh, reservoir and then released. So going forth, we're going to continue to translocate in 2018, 2019, and 2020 doing annual red surveys and the electro fishing, as well as uh, after 2020, we're going to continue to monitor the area. We might not be uh, actively translocating, but we'll continue to monitor the area, um, doing annual uh, red surveys and things like that, just making sure that uh, things are still healthy and, and, and seeing what's going on there. So that kind of wraps it up as far as where we are at now and where we're going at in the future. Um, so just some special thanks to you know Oregon State University who helped us get set up and uh, and ready for those electrofishing surveys, Army Corps of Engineers and Fish and Wildlife Service for helping facilitate this project. Into the river, yeah, and 
you were seeing reds um, the following year? Yeah, so that was uh, so that was fall of 2013 that they, our translocation would have been done by spring of 2014, so just five, six months later we were already detecting reds in the stream systems. Okay, so the, then the macrothalmia that you're seeing are most likely close to four years of age um, that they would be. They should be in that age range. So it would either be from that first initial translocation in 2013 or potentially the translocation in 2014. Yeah, yeah. cool. Nice job. Um, I was curious, do you know what the status is of the passage facilities? I seem to recall that the Corps was going to do some revamping, but I don't know where that's at. Um, yeah, so there, um, as far as the in-migration, the, the ladders that they have there, um, it wasn't set up for lamprey passage. Uh, the staff there at the facility kind of went above and beyond and just MacGyvered their own little ways of making it a little more lamprey suitable. Um, with stuff that they had on, on hand from recent uh, renovations to the dam. So there have been some modifications made to uh, allow it to be a little more lamprey friendly, and we are looking for future relationships with that to, to uh, continue that modification process. Quick phone question. Sir? Uh, my understanding is uh, Fall Creek, they do a flush to uh, flush out salmonids. Any idea what the effect of that is on a... Uh, yeah, so they do the annual drawdown to run of the river, and our, one of our initial thoughts was that that would uh, assist in macrothalmia outmigration or juvenile outmigration. Now, taking into consideration that could potentially affect uh, amicetes that are uh, in, in rearing habitat, what we did look at is, is lower down towards the dam, there's, there's, or where, where the drawdown affects mostly in that system, there's a lot of bedrocks. So there's not a ton of rearing habitat in there to begin with. Um, but the drawdown is done quite slowly and methodically, so it's, it's not like they're just being flushed out all at once. Um, we would imagine they have time to make it back into the water column um, to, you know, have minimal effect as far as their rearing habitat goes lower towards the dam. Um, where we're actually translocating to is much higher up the dam, and where we're surveying for uh, amicetes is much higher up from the dam, and we don't see that that area is being affected by the drawdown. Great, thanks. You bet. Um, Eric, <coughs> sorry, my voice is really bad. But, um, uh, the collection at Willamette Falls, were there any mortality in the years that you've translocated? And, and, and do you see any kind of differences in, in the adults that you collect in, in terms of dorsal gap and, and kind of um, size classes and, um, in general? Yeah, we are seeing you know, different size classes and things of that nature. Um, as far as mortality, we haven't had any mortality into the actual translocation process. Now, once they're released into Fall Creek, uh, we continue to monitor. There's probably some predation and things like that that are happening on that end. Um, but we haven't had any uh, mortality or even during the actual translocation process. And, and just really, uh, the macro, getting the macros is, is a great, great way to kind of monitor, you know, how many years it takes for them to come out and it would be really good to continue the genetic study portion for the adults and, and the juveniles that you collect. They're really interested to see how in the following years how it come, how it turns out. It, it, if we have the adult genetics and we um, we can know, you know how many years it took them to come out and, and, and it's sometimes hard to have a good juvenile collection facility. So, it sounds like you, you do have one, and I really look forward to the future study. Yeah, we were just discussing that this morning, and it would be very interesting to take, uh, now that we know that they are out migrating, to take genetic samples from them and compare them with the genetic samples of the adults that we translocated and try and see, you know, what are the parental, what, was it the thir 2013 translocation, was it 2014 translocation, and start making those matches and seeing how long they are rearing in there. It just, you know, puts more credibility to the study, puts more credibility to the translocation process and these types of processes that could happen at other locations in the future.
Are you keeping track of the numbers of the natural returns now that you say are coming up through the dam? Yes, we have, we have been keeping track of the numbers. They have been um, just, just minimal. Uh, the first year, that was 2015, there was seven that returned to the adult or the catch facility, but that was the first time that they had any return in, in, in decades. Um, so even just a couple is, is awesome. Uh, 2016, like I said, the, the catch facility wasn't operating because of high, high, uh, high water flows. And then in 2017, just here in Dan January, they had, I want to say it was somewhere in the realm of, of 10 or more, something like that, returned in January. Um, so it, it's small numbers, but it's more than that was happening even five years ago. Um, so it's, it's hopeful if, if the numbers start increasing, if the pheromones levels start increasing, Hopefully, the, uh, the adult in migration will start increasing as well. And are you genetic sampling the natural returns as well as your translocated fish? We haven't been, we haven't been sampling the, the, the natural returns. Okay. Um, staff at the dam have just been catching them in the catch facility and then, and then releasing them above the dam. Um, that is something that we've talked about is potentially having them take genetic samples for, for us now that they're starting to return. So that's definitely something we're going to explore. And then are they uh, measuring or uh, looking at maturation? Or I'm curious if the spring fish were mature that overwintered below? Or yeah, they, you know, they're, they're taking uh, measurements and lengths and stuff like that and recording all of that data as well. So. Cool. Yeah. Okay, I think one more. It's like key one, who question. are the staff at the dam? What's that? Who, who are the staff at the dam? Are they... Core employees, or yeah, they're core employees. Did you have any more? Yeah. Then I'm cutting Ralph off. Okay, one more. Uh, the picture of the western muck looked like a class B with, with the speckles on the tail, and I was wondering if are you, all the western mucks that you've seen sort of like those, or are they? Are they we're getting a mix. Yeah. yeah, I just used this photo because I thought it was a pretty clear representation of two different species. So. Okay, but you get a mix of like uh, clear tail, uh, clear fin. Yeah. Getting some of those. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. Puff above and downstream. <laughs> we only we only surveyed below the dam before we started the translocation process. Now we're just surveying above. The Right. Thanks, Tori. That was a great presentation, really interesting stuff. I think we're all looking forward to the results from this year and next year and future years for that. Um, so our next speaker is John Hess. He's a fishery scientist for the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. And he's going to be presenting today on Pacific lamprey conservation genomics and kind of talking about how we can use genetics as a tool with translocation. Okay, thank you. And this is the clicker. Stay John, just stay away from these mics. Okay. Alright. Thanks everyone. And uh, yeah, so the title of my talk is Pacific Lamprey Conservation Genomics, and that's kind of a fancy way of saying that we're taking advantage of all the most recent advances in genetic technology, developing some applications for monitoring lamprey in the basin um, and beyond, as well as filling in some biological uncertainties um, in the same process. And um, one of the things that I, I wanted to mention is that I made a miscalculation since I didn't get to attend much of the presentations that um, I figured somebody would be presenting the cycle, life cycle of lamprey, and everyone would be well versed on that. But I guess we haven't really gone over that. So I was just going to say briefly, from what we know, um, is that lamprey are supposed to um, take about seven years in freshwater, um, rearing in streams as larvae, and then right around that that seven year mark. Um, they're going to be uh, transforming into macrothalmia, though we heard um, that could be as early as four years, and uh, then going out to the ocean and spending perhaps about three years in the ocean 
uh, rearing out there. So um, there's, there's a lot we don't know about all these pieces, and, and one of the things I'm going to be talking about is how we can use some of these genetic tools to help explore some of that missing information. So the genetic technology that we have is this fancy inspector gadget device that um, we have about 300 genetic markers, and we've pared those down from thousands of markers that we've identified in Pacific lamprey um, using uh, some of this genotyping by sequencing technology that I won't go into. But um, we've pared that down to about 300 genetic markers, and what this allows us to do is, um, for one thing, uh, parentage analysis. So we have um, our doohickey here that can assign offspring to a pair of parents or a single uh, parent. Uh, and this is important because um, for, for areas where uh, lamprey haven't been extirpated and you're throwing these lamprey there as a way to boost population abundance, we can still assign uh, the offspring to these single parents that are being thrown up there. They, they spawn and mate with, with other parents that have already been there and not been sampled. So we can also identify species, and I'm sure Ralph has mentioned a little bit about that work. Um, but for this panel that I'm talking about, um, we have some markers that can distinguish Pacific lamprey from other species of lamprey in the basin. We also have these um, adaptive genes for body size, and, and if I have time, I'll get to some of that. So first, what I want to talk about is um, what can genomics do for you? and, and so. As you're going about um, trying to restore lamprey to the basin and you want to monitor the, you know, these projects in some way, um, what can these applications do for that, that process? And so this brings me to parentage-based tagging. And um, we're using parentage-based tagging as a tool to monitor lamprey, um, particularly the translocation programs in the basin on a basin-wide level. And so this is a very important slide that um, I want to spend a little bit of time on. Um, we have, uh, from Brian's presentation, you know that um, three, three of the, the tribes are participating in the translocations, Yakima Nation, Umatilla, and Nez Perce. And so we're, we're getting the adults that are being released into these seeded areas. Um, we're following them a little ways downstream and having a point downstream where we're detecting uh, some of the juveniles and larvae that are being produced from these adults. And then, as they work their way downstream in the system even further, John Day Dam is another place that is downstream of all three translocation programs that we're also capturing these juveniles. And um, this translocation program has been going on for quite some time, but the genetic um, monitoring has only kicked in since about 2013, where we got every single adult that has been um, released at these three different areas. And so 100% coverage of these adults, and we can assign uh, their offspring to all of these adults. And that effectively tags every single offspring that has come from these translocation programs since 2013. And I guess I wanted to pause here and ask you guys um, how many uh, volitional returns you think come to John Day Dam uh, since 2012 to about 2015. Does anyone have a number that they want to throw out there? Anyone? Adults or juveniles? Adults. Bueller? <laughs> 40,000. 40,000? 20. 20? I have 76,000 in my calculations, but that's, that's kind of back of the envelope. Um, but in comparison to that, um, there's been about um, 9,000 uh, translocated adults during that, that time frame. So um, they actually represent around 11% on average each year of the total spawning population. So we think that that's um, actually detectable scale um, to, to get some numbers there. And we can attribute all three different programs the amount of contribution to the total out production at John Day uh, Dam based on that. But in the future, so if we have our first um, uh, tagged adults in 2013, uh, based on what we know about how long they rear in, in freshwater, about seven years, 
So we're expecting about 2020 that we would be detecting those first um, juveniles coming through the, the dam. As they go out into the ocean, you know, we add another three years to that, and then maybe they're even returning to the Willamette Falls or Bonneville Dam. And so by 2023, we're hoping that in the future we might even be able to detect the, the full life cycle and get some of these returning adults. So now I should be cueing the Mission Impossible uh, theme song because, uh, you know, we have to ask, is this really a, a needle in the haystack kind of operation or um, is this feasible? And um, the good news is it's feasible. I'm going to give away that part of the story. Um, we have an example from uh, NESPERS, uh, their translocation program that has been um, in, in operation since 2007. Elmer Crow um, helped you know, release some of the, the first uh, adults uh, into Newsom Creek, Lolo, some of the other uh, streams in the Nez Perce areas. And um, we've been uh, getting some of those genetic tissues and we've analyzed them. Um, downstream of uh, these release sites is uh, Lower Granite Dam. Lower Granite Dam um, is downstream of about 100,000 square miles of um, drainage area for the Snake River Basin. So this is quite a, a large um, basin. So um, what do we have? So uh, for translocations, I said 2007 was the, the first translocation. Um, that was you know, approximately 150 fish. Um, and then since then, uh, these translocations have kind of varied, but um, uh, have uh, gone up in recent years. And this blue line that's really hard to see for all the people in the back um, travels right or along the, the third percentage mark. Um, so about 33% uh, on average um, is what the translocations make up for the total um, adult spawning abundance in the Snake River Basin. So that's, that's a sizable amount. Now, um, for genetic monitoring, the crucial piece is how many of these um, adults that have been released have been genetically sampled. And for that, I'm going to rely, rely on this red line here. We would hope that we would see 100% for the entire um, period, but you can see in the, the very beginning, um, we didn't even have genetic markers back in 2007. Nobody really knew what these tissues were for. They collected some, hoping that something could be done with them. Then by 2010, nothing was collected. It goes up to 100% in 2011, drops again, and then right around 2013 is, is sustained to the the 100% level. But what that means is in this yellow line I'm showing the total um, estimated adult um, spawning mass that we have genetically tagged in the basin. And you can see that in the early years we were down at the, the about 11% mark and then it starts climbing and then it matches pretty much um, the, the proportion of translocation fish that have been released in the basin because we've achieved 100%, so right around 35%. Now, why am I throwing out all these proportions? Well, it's important context when um, you consider um, what we're collecting now at Lower Granite Dam, where each year we're collecting hundreds of juveniles, and um, we're trying to assign them back to our baseline. And so we started this back in 2011 and didn't get any assignments back to our translocated adults. But slowly we started seeing maybe 10% and then dropping down again. By 2016, it had reached over um, 25%. So now we're at one in four fish coming out of the entire Snake River Basin being attributed to this translocation production. It's pretty amazing. And I think that the only reason that it doesn't match the total number of adults being translocated around 33% is because of our low tagging rates in some years. Some years we didn't have any, and you can't expand a tag rate when you don't have anything to expand from. So how old are they? This is one of the, the really neat pieces that we're getting out of this information. So this is um, based on the recent year, 2016, where we're getting um, nine years of age. That's the oldest um, age class that we could assign back to. Um, we're also getting eight-year-olds, we're getting seven-year-olds, and we're getting four-year-olds, um, just like Fall Creek getting some four-year-old macrothalmia there. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a really interesting piece. Like I said, 
Um, the thought was that it takes them about seven years um, to get uh, to rear up and transform, and we're seeing that it can take much longer, up to nine years. Maybe after this year, we'll see um, 10-year-olds. I'm, I'm thinking that we probably will. So one of the other things that we wanted to address is um, that it makes a big difference where you're collecting these fish, because if you collect them close to um, the point where they're rearing, um, then you're going to get zero years of age up to you know maybe nine years of age. But if you collect at a, a downstream point like lower granite, so here they're being released in Newsom Creek. Um, if you collect them in Lower Granite Dam, 180 river miles away, um, they actually are going to be quite older. So <clears throat> in this case, we saw that um, in Newsom Creek at a screw trap, we were seeing five-year-olds and six-year-olds come out in, in large abundance. And then slowly over time, they've been dwindling down. Um, but still, nine years of age, they're coming out of their original stream as nine-year-olds. Um, downstream of that point, 180 river miles downstream at Lower Granite, this um, group is now ramping up um, so that um, right now they're nine years of age and they've hit about 8% of the total uh, juveniles that we see at Lower Granite. And um, for context, we expect that given the number of adults that were released in Newsom Creek back in uh, 2007, um, that they should make up 4% of all the um, biomass here at Lower Granite, but they are um, twice that number. So they're outperforming uh, what we would have expected given the number that were released there. So they're doing quite well. So how fast do they grow? We think that this has a lot um, to do with um, the, the re release location, um, that some streams we found, um, these are all the different release sites in, in the Snake River Basin that the Nez Perce have used over the years. And that you see in some, some years, um, our, sorry, this is lower granite. In 2016, we see this big array of different, different ages. Um, some fish, um, it takes them you know, seven to nine years of age to come out. But other sites, um, they rear up um, as four-year-olds, and they're, they're passing lower granite down. So there could be some habitat quality issues that are going on here that might explain um, why some um, fish will rear up faster and transform at a younger age than others. Um, the other thing that we've uh, really looked at is um, two sites in particular uh, in the Snake River Basin, Lolo and Newsom Creek, um, where they, they have very um, similar age classes um, in their composition coming out of these streams, but their length composition is um, pretty different. And I'll, I'll just go through this quickly. Um, length composition is different in that Lolo um, tends to grow up um, bigger sized fish um, at age than uh, Newsom Creek, and also Lolo tends to produce more macrothalmia um, than, than Newsom Creek at the same ages. Um, this is also interesting in that um, sea lamprey um, have been uh, studied long before um, Pacific lamprey and um, has a lot of this kind of growth information um, that has been, uh, you know, published back in 1960 or so. Um, but the, the growth information that we're getting from Newsom Creek and Lolo um, really uh, fits quite well with what we know about sea lamprey in the Great Lakes. So, um, their growth um, curves are, are very similar, but um, there's some variation. So this is uh, Newsom Creek. Lolo Creek is up here, um, almost off the chart of that, that growth curve. So that there's going to be differences between sites, um, and uh, that's going to create a lot of differences in the, these growth rates and, and the size at age. Um, so one of the other things that we have as applications for this um, genetic information is that we can take a group of uh, juveniles and based on their genetic relationships, we can estimate the number of adults that produce them. And this is kind of an interesting index of abundance when you're not able to count adults uh, for particular streams, um, you know, which is difficult to do with, with lamprey. So um, we have here uh, Deep Creek out on the Olympic Peninsula that Mary Mosier um, collected. And we have an estimate of about 310. We have 15 Mile Creek um, 
just below the Dalles at 206 that Warm Springs collected. And then we have um, Umatilla um, right at three mile down, or a uh, screw trap right at the <coughs> mouth, um, where we have an estimate of about 151 adults. And then at Lower Granite, we have an estimate of about 540 adults. So these are juveniles that are collected out migrating from these points, and we're estimating the adults that, um, the likely number of adults that produce them. And we're trying to understand um, the relationship of you know, drainage area and where these streams are located, but right now we're not really seeing a whole lot of correlation of just um, the size of the, the drainage area and the, the total number of adults that are being estimated. This um, stream out on the Olympic Peninsula is very small. It's a hundred, you know, less than 100 square miles, but it's producing <coughs> a sizable um, group of adults, or that estimate is a sizable group of adults that um, even matches perhaps the, uh, the entire Snake River Basin. Um, we're learning a lot about the, the sex life of Pacific lamprey. Um, you know, how, how many mates do they choose uh, in, in the stream that we have in Newsom Creek where we have, you know, all the adults sampled. Um, we know that multiple mating happens quite a bit. This is a pedigree that we reconstructed from, from all the adults that were released that year. And it's somewhere around 65% of them um, engage in, in multiple mating, and it goes both ways, both males and females. So the genetic based uh, species ID that I touched upon, and maybe Ralph um, mentioned in his talks, um, we have two pairs of markers that can distinguish Pacific lamprey from uh, other species in the Lampetra genus, Western Brooks, River lamprey, Pacific Brook lamprey. Um, and these are 100% um, uh, accurate so far. We've used this um, type of marker to um, document uh, natural reintroduction. This was Warm Springs collecting um, fish in the Hood River above um, uh, Powerdale Dam after that dam was removed and there were no um, larvae that were found for Pacifics um, prior to the, the dam removal and then after the dam some larvae were detected in electrofishing and these were identified as Pacific lamprey. So they can recolonize on their own um, uh, once those, those passage um, barriers are removed. So um, how much time do I have left? Am I over? You're a minute. Okay. I'll just um, talk a little bit about um, this last set. So this is my futuristic slide um, where you know, I, I use this quote from the movie Gattaca, there's no gene uh, for the lamprey spirit. Um, you know, it was the human spirit in Gattaca, but um, we don't have a gene for the lamprey spirit, but we may actually have a gene for um, knowing the upstream fate of lamprey or the, the body size of lamprey. So um, we have actually have in this panel of genetic markers, um, some of these genetic markers are associated with um, uh, the adult body size. So when they come back to the, the streams to spawn, um, we can kind of predict based on their genotypes how big they're going to be. And this is important. Um, we follow this work up from a data set uh, that Lori Porter collected in 2016 where she actually had information on, on the sex of lamprey. And we have these, um, uh, these categories based on the genetic information where we assign them as big, um, middle big, middle small, and small lamprey based on their genetic information, not knowing anything about the actual sizes of them. And it correlates really nicely um, with the adult lengths. And <coughs> one of the things that um, we, we want to understand is, you know, what, what causes this? You know, why are these different um, body sizes um, uh, have this, this genetic basis? And what is the importance of body size for lamprey? And, and you know, at what stage um, is critical in determining their body size? We think that it's probably the ocean period that uh, determines how big they get, because that's really where they're, they're um, growing quite rapidly. So <clears throat> at Bonneville, um, we have one size distribution that we see um, that are fairly large fish. When we look at Willamette, we have um, a much smaller size distribution. So this is their, their length histi histograms. And so I want to go back to Bonneville. There's Willamette. There's Bonneville. So um, these, 
these lampreys seem to be sorting themselves out in a way that as they go upstream in the Columbia River Basin, um, it's really the, the largest lamprey that are making at the furthest distance. And so this is a very interesting pattern and has a lot um, of implications um, when we think about you know, whether every lamprey is created equal or not. Um, they seem to be, um, there's certain body types that might be optimal for certain habitats. So in summary, how old are they? You know, we're seeing a range between um, zero and nine years of age plus in, in fresh water so far. How fast do they grow? Um, we're seeing that um, they slow as they age. When they get closer to transformation, their growth rates are slowing down. But um, So early on, they can be 28 millimeters per year, but then they start gradually decreasing that, that growth rate as they get close to transformation. Um, how many families do they represent? This can vary across streams, and we still don't fully understand it, but 20% um, is a good working number. Um, when you see adults coming into a stream, you um, might have a pretty good understanding if you apply 20% of that as what's actually going to spawn in that stream. Where do they transform, or when do they transform between four and nine years of age? Um, how long is their migration to salt water? That's a data gap. Uh, how long is their ocean phase? Another data gap. We've learned in uh, Ben Clemens' talk that um, where do they go? Maybe as far as uh, the Bering Sea and back. Um, for body size, um, is that determined in the, the ocean period? That's another data gap. Lots of uncertainties here still to understand. Um, in Ben Clemens' talk, he might have uh, mentioned also that there's um, pretty much random sorting as it um, pertains to the the natal site um, relating back to the, the spawning site. Um, this uh, mixes up the uh, gene flow across the range pretty well for Pacific lamprey in contrast to salmon. Um, how do adults choose mates? Um, that's another data gap, but how many mates um, up to 65% in a stream are going to be multiply mating um, from what, what we've seen? So future plans, um, we have a lot more advancing to do. Um, Currently, uh, three genomes for Pacific lamprey are being sequenced, and um, we hope that that's going to give us a, a more thorough understanding of um, why uh, there's a genetic basis for body size and other traits. Uh, we're also looking for a sex determining marker that will help with um, some of the, the conservation activities. Um, getting more genetic markers, um, we're uh, using parentage-based tagging to continue to track um, fish older and older as they age um, through their, their life cycle. And you know, by 2017, we're going to be at the 10-year mark for the oldest uh, lamprey that we're monitoring, but we hope to continue through their entire life cycle. We're looking at adaptation outside the basin, looking to see if these length um, correlates um, exist for these genetic markers. Uh, working with uh, Ralph Lentman on incipient speciation of, of other uh, species of, of lampreys, western brooks in the interior. I'm sure he talked a little bit about that. Um, Statolith microchemistry is another um, facet that we're trying to explore to see if we can get at some of that ocean age um, information. If, if we can see uh, growth rings on the statolith like they use for salmon and otoliths. Um, but we'll, we'll see if that pans out. So there's a ton of people that um, really contribute to this work and are responsible for all these exciting results. And um, I'd just like to acknowledge everyone, um, but there's uh, Matt Kiefer and Chris Caudill from University of Idaho, Aaron Jackson uh, from Umatilla, and uh, Dave, Statler, uh, Dave Statler from Nez Perce. Uh, Sean Naram runs the genetic lab in Hagerman, where we um, run all our samples. Stephen Micheletti is a geneticist there who um, contributes a lot to these analyses. There's Alexi Orleib um, and uh, Josh Morauskas who have contributed to the, the um, pit tag information that where we understood um, how far they can go up to the Bering Sea and back. Um, Jessica Miller at OSU contributes to the statolith microchemistry. Brian McElrath here, you know. And um, uh, Mary Mosier has um, been helping us with uh, the Umatilla uh, samples and understanding all sorts of things, including contributing to that genome work that we're 
we're, we're doing. And Laurie Porter uh, coordinates all this genetic collection and really does an amazing job. Uh, Ralph Lampman, who you know, and Jeremiah Smith at University of Kentucky. Uh, he's been doing uh, genome work for sea lamprey and is involved in, in our work um, to continue these genetic applications for, for Pacific lamprey. So with that, take any questions if I still have some time. Thanks, John. That was great information. So, were all the juveniles that you sampled as mortalities at granite macrothalamia, or were there a mixture of amicetes and max? Um, I think Lori would probably have a better answer than me, but for the most part, we see max. Um, very few larvae at, at lower granite. I, I don't know if Lori would have an actual number for it or not, but. Yeah, I don't have an exact number because we sampled so many, but um, I think there's more ammos than we originally thought. So, um, but I was curious about that myself. Your your um, pie chart with the ages from lower granite were those all max? I know we we on the data sheets we marked whether they were max or ammos. Yeah, I I think for the most part. Um, we see only max, and okay. um, so there, there might be a few here that were larvae, but it would be pretty few. All right. John, you know from the Columbia River in the tribal for uh, a lot of the information that's given to the tribal uh, people, so we can evaluate uh, lamprey areas with not only lamprey, but also the salmon and everything else that's involved in tribal areas. And you see how they gathered a lot of you guys together here uh, once a year. Actually, it should be more than once a year, you know, that uh, you guys get together and evaluate a lot of this stuff. Because we learn and our younger children learn. And uh, we learn and they learn from you as well as they learn from us. So I want to thank Brian and John you know, from the intertribal side, and but also, yeah, and Bob Rose, you know that, um, and all the tribal uh, biologists that are here, that come here and have input on this. And I just want to thank you guys for putting this on. Thank you. about um, sampling timing. So when were the fish at um, lower granite sampled? And was that encompassing the same time period as your screw trap? Or was it just like one occurrence? So um, Brian might have to answer this as well. But um, what I remember from lower granite is there, um, the core is getting these juveniles impinged on their turbine screens and kind of sampling them opportunistically for this genetic monitoring. And um, they uh, kind of routinely scrape off these screens and, and get these, these juveniles, freeze them in bags, and they come throughout the year. But um, I've seen uh, kind of pulses of large numbers in, in February, March, um, and then, then there's also um, a few that kind of come in, in later months. So, um, they can come from all throughout the year, but um, uh, primarily from the, the early spring um, uh, freshets. I just uh, have, have a question for the broader group. Um, when we're out electrofishing the amicetes because of the importance of the PBT, um, there's a desire to try to take a fin sample from everything. And some of these these, these little amicetes, it's more of an amputation than a fin sample, I think. And so I was wondering if folks have applied uh, like a minimum length for a fin sample. I think Ralph would actually have a really good answer for this. Um, but um, I guess from 
from what we've gathered, at least from Nezpers, um, I I've been seeing um, lengths that are anywhere from say 80 millimeters um, up to 140 or so, um, and um, but we still do get some samples from even smaller uh, larvae and. Um, we have um, various ways of getting a sample that hopefully doesn't um, act as an amputation. It's a, a really small sliver of um, thin tissue, and uh, maybe Ralph can speak to like, you know how big he can go on those. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can. Uh, yeah, like John said, it's a pretty small, small clip. It's only like one millimeter by one millimeter, somewhere like that. And if you just use really sharp scissors, we can get uh, clips all the way down to maybe 50 millimeters, 40, 30, somewhere around there. You just have to have a really uh, kind of fine hand. And then uh, generally, like uh, below 25 millimeters, generally we euthanize the fish and keep them for uh, genetics. But uh, you can get a reasonable clip from maybe 50 millimeters. Thanks. And, you know, John, this is really important work that you guys are doing, and I really appreciate the information that you're providing to us. It's just very important stuff. And I can't help but just ask you, I'm going to put you on the spot. You know, it's no reason that the, or the or it's, there's a really, a reason why the genetics piece is in this translocation section here. So how are we doing with our translocation? Are, there, are we doing our translocation programs, in your opinion, right? Or are there some concerns that uh, you'd like to be able to maybe express some recommendations on how we might be able to improve uh, our translocation programs and maybe reduce some potential risks that we might be uh, beginning to understand now that uh, we might not have been aware of several years ago? You're definitely putting me on the spot, Bob. <laughs> um, I don't want to step in it, but um, I, I guess the only thing that I would say is um, I, I think that we, we have to really look carefully at the, the issue. I, one of the reasons that we're doing this program is to, um, for evaluation and um, being able to you know, implement adaptive management um, where possible. And, um, one thing I would say is that it's a no-brainer, but um, right around 2011, um, we did see in this um, NETSPERS translocation program um, where we hit a really low year, and um, I think there were only uh, you know 20 or so fish that were um, able to be released that year, mm -hmm. and we've we've hardly seen any contribution that would be the the five-year-olds. Um, we see a gap between the the um, uh, actually, um, we see a gap here between the, the seven-year-olds, which are the yellow, and the four-year-olds, because in 2010 we didn't sample any fish. 2011 we um, uh, sampled every fish, but we had so few that we didn't see really much recruitment at all. And um, so I, I guess I would say there there is going to be a minimum number that um, Will, will probably be the optimal um, point where you don't want to go much beyond that for translocations. Um, one of the things that probably contributes to that, though, is sex ratios. Um, you know, whether we've gotten our sex ratios balanced or not for all these different releases is is another issue. But um, but yeah, so there is a, a minimum number I would say. We don't quite have a handle on that, but we know that there is one, um, and. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that um, I, I feel like you, you can't um, just take um, uh, fish anywhere, um, like from the, the Willamette Falls, um, and uh, take them up to, um, say, the Snake River and expect them um, to be uh, contributing to adults that will um, come back to the Snake River on their own volition. Um, because there, there is some kind of um, size difference across the basin, and, and not every lamprey is created equal. Um, but um, So I, I think there is some optimality um, there for habitat. Um, um, but whether we um, are choosing to 
promote uh, certain types in different regions, um, that's a whole other issue. Um, but I, I think just for effectiveness of translocations, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be um, habitat quality, the, the number that you put in there, and um, probably a whole host of other factors that we quite haven't wrapped our minds around yet. Okay, one more question and then I'm going to invite the panel speakers up here. Hi yeah, John, thanks. Uh, so I was just curious, how many of the, what percent of the fish are you collecting at um, the max at Lower Granite? Uh, do you have any idea of the numbers? Yeah, so um, we've been gradually increasing over the years, um, but we get between uh, about 400 and 1,000 uh, max. Uh, that, that we've gotten fin clips from. So um, so these are all uh, juvenile mortalities um, okay. that are just frozen in bags and we're subsampling um, around you know a, a thousand or so. Um, sometimes it, it's a smaller number, about 400, but, um, but yeah, did you have another component yeah. here? Yeah, so you're not fin clipping any of the fish that would go back to the river? Oh, so they collect it in the bypass and you would release again? Um, right, so yeah, there's no collection of live fish. Okay. I was just curious because that would be a, the fish that... Are you planning on increasing your sample at uh, John Day this year with them opening up their bypass earlier? Um, we would love to increase the sample. So um, the idea is um, that uh, this past year was kind of a, a test year um, where Lori was working with um, uh, people at the, the bypass facility and, um, you know, got around, um, I believe, 700. Um, and so we're not expecting any uh, translocation offspring in that, that group, but we're not sure. Um, but, uh, you know, definitely by 2020, we, we hope to ramp up to um, 2,000. And that number was kind of chosen as a way to um, get at that 10% uh, on average that the translocations are probably contributing um, to that, that group of juveniles. And we would have potentially 200 that we could assign to the translocation programs and of those uh, develop a, a relationship with the, the relative contribution that each tribal program is, is having on that overall production. Great, thanks a lot. Thank you, John. Great information. Um, okay, I'd like to... Excuse me. Okay, I'd like to invite um, my other speakers to come up and sit in the hot seat here. Walk in the room. We can have a bit of a panel discussion if there are any Sorry. additional questions that folks have. Um, and I was Brian mentioned, um, we have some of the uh, tribal folks here that are on the ground that are doing some of the translocation work. So you guys aren't entirely on the hot seat. There are other folks in the audience. We're looking at you, Ralph <laughs> and Dave. <laughs> um, they can potentially Ralph answer. Ralph is the nerd, nerd of the year. <laughs> it's true. We did win this year. Um, they can answer some questions as well. So I'll um, open it up to the group if there are any additional questions. John, I'm just curious, um, when you talk about the sort of size selectivity um, adaptive markers uh, for larger fish potentially coming back to the Columbia and possibly smaller fish going to the Willamette, is there any evidence of that being sort of a base level of genetic variation that was historic to those populations, or is there a way to tell if that's related to size selectivity, possibly through passage? That's a really good question. Um, you know, when we first saw this um, in the Columbia River Basin, we were thinking that um, it could definitely be kind of a, a main product of um, that passage, um, the passage barriers that the hydro system um, creates for these lamprey. Um, but, um, you know, without having historic samples uh, pre-dams, 
it's going to be difficult to get at that question. Um, the one thing that we have seen, though, is that in the Willamette Basin, which um, it does have dams on tributaries, but on the main stem, uh, you know, lamprey can pass up through uh, Willamette Falls and, and volitionally migrate all the way um, up to the upper Willamette. And we see these same genetic patterns in the Willamette that we see on a broader scale in the Columbia. So it, it does seem to um, uh, indicate that uh, these, these passage barriers, um, you know, it's not all artificial. It's um, also kind of the, the uh, maybe journey upstream that um, requires uh, different energy reserves or, or whatever, but the, the larger lamprey do better uh, migrating the furthest distances even without artificial barriers. Joanne, you know that when I talk about the legends and and stuff that maybe you guys got to get an anthropologist or something among your group also to study the legends and stuff that uh, Lamprey have on the eel. Um, that way you'll show as uh, eons of studies where our scientific, um, I guess, uh, things come from. But you know, in, when you're here, you're protecting a lamprey. And one of those little known, known um, issues about the lamprey, you know, that where you might endanger them really bad when I say what your studies are and how you go about your studies, is that uh, if you let it be known that the native people use it as an aphrodisiac, and once that's known to the public, the eel population is going to really go down. So you need to kind of protect that. <laughs> Thank you. They are videotaping this, Bruce, so uh, it looks like it's out. The secret's out. Yeah, uh, this is Mary. I just had a question about um, this. John kind of mentioned it, the, um, the sex distribution of the fish that are used for translocation. And I was wondering, early on at Bonneville Dam, we kind of had an indication that male lamprey came in earlier than female lamprey. And so the timing of collection for translocation could affect that sex distribution. And I was wondering um, if there were data um, more data about that and, and a way to kind of perfect the collection of, of those fish so that you could get a good sex distribution. So I, I guess before handing this over to Ralph, um, I, I would say that, yeah, we have um, two uh, data sets that I know of on this that um, Ralph has looked at this issue at Bonneville um, and and I, I believe hasn't really seen um, a big skew like that when he's looked at it, um, scrutinized the data. Um, Lori, I uh, was hoping to get at this issue, um, and we weren't able to get samples from Bonneville um, to do dissections and collect lethal samples there, but um, she, she did this opportunistically with um, some of the harvesting at Willamette Falls to look at sex ratio, and she saw a perfect 50-50 um, ratio um, throughout you know the season from June to August, and um, uh, you know so at, at least at Willamette Falls that didn't seem to be a big skew, and I guess Ralph can speak to that at Bonneville. Um, yeah, um, yeah, John uh, summarized it really well. I, we we looked at a little little bit more opportunistically, kind of early, mid, and late, and didn't see any patterns there, but, um, but, it, but I still think it, it would be a good, good idea to kind of set up a controlled experiment to kind of answer that question definitively. Uh, but but I, I, I do believe, you know, there, there's these early runs, mid runs, late runs. A lot of the early runs are going further upstream. It wouldn't make much sense for most of the males to come all at once because they, they need to get to these upper places and I think you would need kind of a half and half to make it work um, in all these different regions. That, that's just my, <coughs> my hunch. But. Okay, 
you real quickly. Yeah, uh, also as part of John's work in terms of, uh, was mentioned, size, uh, larger fish migrate uh, further up. And I recall a slide uh, yesterday, I think Brian put it up, I'm not sure, but it was a, an historic photo of adults that were stranded at the base of something in the Hawaii River Basin, which is very, very far, hundreds hundreds of miles upstream, and I was just recalling, I mean, to me, those those adults look huge, <laughs> you know, pretty, pretty large uh, adult lamprey and very far up the basin. Thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> that picture was from the Upper Snake River, and I know that I've talked to John about this, about whether we could, if you could use historical specimens of lamprey to try to see if that, that um, if those genetic um, markers have changed over time pre-industrialization, but it sounds like just the stuff that they're stored in, you just can't get at that that uh, DNA anymore. Because there are um, specimens from, from way back when from all over the place, but it, the, the DNA is just too degraded. But the, that particular picture, they do look like big lamprey. The one lady's holding one, and it's you know it looks like a big, long fish, which would make sense that that fish was able to make it all the way up there. Um, <clears throat> things like uh, translocation and artificial propagation can be excellent conservation tools, but they can also cause major problems. I was just curious of the panel's thoughts on the pros and cons of using these tools versus just um, fixing passage problems and restoring habitat processes and allowing natural recolonization. Yeah, I'll take a stab at that real quick. I think that. The, that was um, a thought process that, that went on early in the, the translocation um, program, in particular with the Umatilla tribe. I think they, they recognized, um, one, the lamprey are very different, or they thought very different than salmon, so you had to take off your, your salmon-colored glasses. There's a lot of issues with salmon, artificial propagation, and that kind of thing, and that lamprey was its own, its own beast, uh, for lack of a better term, so we had to kind of uh, learn a new way of thinking for those fish, um, but that, that also the passage issues uh, were not going to take care of themselves, and, and frankly, it was just going to take a long time. It's still going to take a long time, and they just were not um, willing to wait until all the answers were in front of them to to, to move forward. They chose to, um, to, to to be proactive about it, but then also monitor and evaluate their efforts so that as we learn more, as in like the genetic information, we can tweak the uh, protocols and the, and the things that they're doing to, to fine tune uh, their efforts and so we can identify if there are gonna be major issues. But genetically speaking, these are very different. Um, I mean, they're way far on the end of the uh, pandemic scale, scale, not quite there, but um, on a totally different scale than, than salmon are. So certainly not lost uh, in the initial um, efforts there, and we're continuing to, to learn about that as we move forward, so. Um, this is not a question, but I just kind of want to throw in some compliment information. So, I work on the Clackamas, and our fish that we have captured in our trap are smaller than the fish at Willamette on average size. And so it's kind of interesting that the size, you see the size distribution between Bonneville and Willamette, and the clock is being so close to the Willamette, we also see that divide. I hate to dwell on the morts at collected at Lord Granite, but anyway, are the bags labeled with date so I'm just thinking there's an opportunity to explore life history, migration characteristics of some of these fish from the different drainages, and if there is a pattern to, um, especially with, with my experience trapping at Lower Granite in the mid 80s, there was a lot of amicids coming down in those traveling screens and in the orifice traps. So if there's an opportunity through genetics to identify where these fish are coming from and what their migration and their their pattern is, I think that would be useful information. I can take that. Uh, so Jody, the pattern, um, and so 
it, in the lower snake projects, the, the fish that we're using for the genetic analysis are from the turbine cooling water strainers. So they, they, they clean those out. Uh, it just depends on the dam, uh, the logistics of actually opening that up. But um, weekly, monthly, uh, the pattern is that there's no pattern to where those fish are. You may go a month without seeing any, and then you may get you know, 4,000 uh, fish there. The bags that we have, have used are all labeled well, but um, the bag that you have that has a thousand fish in it may be from the, the previous three months of uh, uh, passage, and, and that's just what you have uh, in there. Um, we could probably, you know, if we can get at, if we have genetic information for the adults for those fish, then we can try to get at where those fish uh, were. And I know that the Army Corps, from that data, from the um, turbine cooling water strainer data, they tried to use that information to, to figure out if there is a pattern about migration. There really, there really wasn't. And I think that it was Damon Goodman, I think either on Tuesday or yesterday, that showed the out-migration of juvenile lamprey in California where they can just kind of come out whenever. And that's the same pattern that we see in the lower snake. Uh, the summertime, you don't see as many fish. But once, a, once fall hits, then it, it can kind of be whenever that you're going to see fish out migrating. I just wanted to add a little bit to that. Um, uh, the, the one thing that I remember, though, from the 2016 collection of juveniles, um, we, we had just a few, um, there is some variation in the, the, the months that you know, those juveniles represented. Um, but all the translocation assignments, almost 80% or 90% of them, all came from February even though we had other, other months represented there. So I, I'm, you know, I, I think that's a great question, and I think it's something that we'll be able to look at um, in the future. We, we may not have a precise um, estimate for exactly when they were migrating through Lower Granite. Like Brian said, these are pools of samples. But um, hopefully we can get a little bit of information at that. The other thing is um, uh, Brian had this really good uh, telemetry study of the, the first release in Newsom Creek. And um, he actually had you know, some adults that were released um, further upstream in Newsom and some that were released um, closer to the screw trap at the mouth. And that those family groups um, diverged in the timing of when their um, offspring were out migrating from Newsom Creek, um, just um, with some of that variation in, in where they might have been rearing. So um, uh, that was an interesting pattern that I'm sure on an even larger scale at Lower Granite, you would see some very large differences among the various different release locations and their timing through the, the dam. Um, I have a comment and some quest, uh, kind of a question. Anyways, just kind of focusing on the upper part of the Columbia. Um, drainage and wanted to add also that the Colville Confederated Tribe did some translocations in the Okanagan River and in the tributary of the Similkameen. So as part of that in looking at um, distribution we did not find any, have not found any lamprey up in there and there's very few lamprey moving upstream of Wells Dam which is the ninth dam on the Columbia. But we also did some sampling just downstream of Chief Joseph Dam and in Foster Creek, which is a small tributary right there, and did not find any lamprey, but um, just kind of curious on some comments about when you're getting further away, both like nine dams up or above um, Chief Joe and Grand Coulee, because Kettle Falls isn't too far up there, which was a traditional harvest location, we have ecological benefits of having um, larval lamprey up in there, but just kind of curious as to um, the role of translocation in places that are so far away that we have an ecological benefit of the larvae, but we might have a really difficult time getting adults back into those areas. So both from a science and a tribal perspective, I'm interested. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess with the, with the site that we're working at specifically, uh, we know that adults were already making it up towards the dams. So as far as their feasibility in making it there, um, 
I think they see that that was an issue. Um, now, as far as placing them in, in areas where, like you had mentioned, that it's potential that uh, adults weren't able to make it there, is that what you're kind of well, getting at? I mean, they, there's very few that are making it upstream of Wells Dam mm -hmm. into both the Meto and, and they haven't been coming back into the Okanagan because there's so few adults making it, but they're translocating, but at least those fish have a chance of out migrating and returning. Um, but then in addition, upstream of um, Grand Coulee Dam, there's, you know, there isn't the upstream downstream passage, but they were historically there. So, you know, if you were translocating for an ecological benefit of having lamprey up there again. Yeah, I think uh, if they were historically there, the feasibility of them returning there, I think, is, is still there. Uh, granted, passage issues are, are solved. Um, so I think primarily what we're looking at is, is passage issues. Are they able to make it back? Um, ecologically speaking, I, I'm not sure what the negative effect of that would be. I don't know. One of you guys have any thoughts about that? I think, um, you know, the Nez Perce are, you know, among our member tribes, they're the farthest up. Um, their seeded areas are the farthest up, or their uh, streams that they're working on are the farthest up. And they know that you know, passage is poor at eight dams, you know, uh, eight dams times 50%. By the time you get up there, it's that's pretty poor uh, conversion rate from Bonneville Dam all the way to, to Lower Granite. So they understand that, um, that they're putting fish in a location that's way up there, but they want to maintain that connection, that, that uh, cultural connection and then the ecological connection um, and use that as motivation to improve passage at all those uh, locations. If they were to wait until everything was fixed, I mean, that's, that's going to be a long, a long time. And as the uh, translocation tribes, and even the, sh the tribes that, have, that are lucky to have fish returning, that when you have fish in the river, both adults and juveniles, and you can really identify problems and address begin addressing those problems if you have no fish then it's you're shooting in the dark I, I think uh, Brian and Tori answered this really well I just wanted to add um, it sounds like this question is kind of um, a question about priorities of if you have um, limited funding and you want to know how to use you know your funding um, to get the most bang for the buck um, is it worthwhile putting translocated fish um, in an area where they may not likely volitionally migrate back to um, based on the passage is issues? And I, I see this um, you know, in the same perspective that, that Brian mentioned, um, that you know, you know, on, at every um, stage of their, their life cycle, um, they're contributing to the ecosystem in a positive way. And so, you know, these larvae um, are filter feeding in the streams and um, purifying that water. Um, they're um, providing nutrition um, and food for the, the fish, the salmon that are, are growing there. Um, and then as they make their way through the, the hydro system um, and out to the ocean, they're contributing to the ecosystem in those ways. But the issue about you know how to justify it to people um, when you don't have much of a reason to expect that these adults are going to return back to the places where you've invested in, you know I think um, to answer that that issue, it's really about um, a broader investment into the species. Is that um, the production that is coming from those those streams is is helping a species maintain itself and particularly the forms that you would expect in those upper reaches, those large fish um, that um, really need some viable quality habitat to rear in and um, continue on with those those types in that, that species complex for those species to be able to rear, go out to the ocean and come back somewhere, maybe not the same place, but they are contributing to the species as a whole. I think that's a very valuable um, investment. Just to touch on, on just one more thing there, I think in, in a lot of cases uh, when we're looking at solving passage issues, if the species aren't there, um, it's harder to prioritize that passage issue. 
Um, so if, if the species is there via translocation, you can say, well, there's good spawning habitat, there's good rearing habitat. Now they are here, they've been translocated here. It does put a little more pressure on, on them to prioritize to fix those passage issues. <laughs> yeah, John, um, Brian, and uh, I think that, you know, in order to really achieve something on knowledge and these meetings and uh, coming up that you know when you guys contact the four tribes and everything to set up these meetings I think what would be really beneficial is contact the tribes and set a location at one of these tribal areas within you know, the year as the years go by and that way you can see the actual gathering locations or you can actually see the programs that are being done uh, by the tribes to uh, enhance these eel runs. But also, you would also have that opportunity for that host tribe to uh, actually prepare lamprey on how they're cooked and how, you know, how they're prepared. And that way you'd be able to taste something that what you're protecting. And uh, you'll find out the reason why that uh, uh, you know, how the eels taste and everything. It was really interesting because when you start talking about uh, Colville and stuff, you got to remember that the big lamprey gathering grounds also was at Kettle Falls and, uh, and their harvesting area, yeah. So uh, you want to make uh, mention of that, but really look at um, and meet with the four tribes and uh, other tribes that are there and actually get some funding from them to prepare these areas for meals, be it at Warm Springs or Yakima, Nespers, Umatilla. Uh, they have these um, convention centers that we can host a bunch of people and yet have that meal and stuff set up that we can have showing what the lamprey is all about. It sounds like an invitation to Kanita in the spring, Bruce. You host it. I'm going to need a lot of those tips on preparing lamprey because the ones that I prepared, nobody would touch. <laughs> One of the things there that, uh, you know, deciding our people's food supply, the, the salmon went all the way up into Canada, but I wish I seen one of them here, but the Bureau, Bureau of Reclamation and the State Department sent a letter to Canada asking if there was any commercial fishing up there. See, again that made the people up there invisible because they do their own traditional subsistence fishing and when they said no, there was no fish passage on those dams. So that makes me always wonder why. Why are they trying to do away with our food supplies? Spokane River, all of those rivers up there don't have any. The Okanagan does now because of the, the sockeye being placed in there. And look at how the numbers are rebounding up there. So it, it comes down to the water. Think back before those dams were in place, before the farmers was putting their pesticides and fertilizers and all of that, how the ground, how the water was, was clean and cold. So, you know, these are some of the things there that you're, you're not hearing. And, and it's not up to uh, government agencies to decide what our diet is, our natural food supply, and that's what those are the lamprey, the salmon, and the other fish species. I guess, Brian, you know, I think a, a name of the next conference should be Babylon Brook. 
<laughs> because a babbling brook is what tells these animals when to be there and where to go. And uh, I think during that time, the Corps of Engineers or uh, Bonneville Power can, uh, or whoever does these tests, can show where the sound attraction is there. And maybe at that time, they can give a report on, hey, that does work, or, you know, we tried it and it, we didn't have nothing there, or something like that. So um, the babbling brook is the sound that the animals use to go back to that area, the sound that it carries, you know, the regardless of where, and I think this person wants to talk to. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to commend the, the overall um, message that the meeting held. And like I said, I've been around Brian since he's been around here, and I've uh, been around. And I want to thank Kelly for uh, remembering and bringing back the late Elmer Crow. That's, um, I was uh, brought onto the commission and uh, took over as chairman of the Nesper Stripes Fish and Wildlife Commission, and he helped me along the way through many trails and many meetings and getting to hear what he had to say and, and also the late Herb Jackson who were passionate about bringing back the, the eel, our brother. And uh, the one thing that um, I want to uh, say about what Brian has done in, in previous meetings is the commission had um, a 1% translocation um, tape that we were um, going with each tribe. Well, this past year we upped that to 2%. And so therefore, the three translocation tribes are taking about 6% of, of the return of eels. And, um, and for us, the Nespers, just speaking on behalf of us, that was a, a, a big jump, a big boost, if you will, in what we were doing in terms of our efforts. And we were elated about it. We talked about it. And, and even though 2% seems quite small, um, we do start to see some of the returns. We start to see some of the efforts being um, come to fruition, if you will. But the one thing I did want to say is I commend the commission and get the tribes for coming forth. And translocation isn't a fix-all. You know, it's a remedy, it's, a, it's something to supplement, but it's not something that we, we know. It, I mean, for us, it's getting fish back to the headwaters and having them in pristine habitat, which we do have. And so, and uh, you spoke of the eight dams, we have to, you know, we've been fighting that for so long, but as John and that Brian and them have stated that, you know, if we wait for the fix-alls to happen, you know, they aren't going to happen overnight. So we have to do whatever we can to try to bring them back. And so those, um, I thank the people for echoing the past leaders because I think it's important for us to understand and absorb what they thought back then and how it's carried forward to now. So, and I, I love all the, the connected, um, literature and the things that you're sharing with us because it, it's really opened my eyes up to a lot of different things now and being a policy person for the tribe now it gives me a little bit more um, in-depth uh, and it get, allows me to go do some more research and then reach out to some of you that have been doing this for quite some time and so I thank you guys all for that part of it from an expert standpoint and one that going forward it needs to be collective and all of us you know come together and like I said I like the I'm now a lamprey nerd. I can call myself that. So. Um, but I appreciate you guys' time and effort. And uh, like I said, um, translocation is, was, is a good thing for, for an element, but it's not the fix-all. So it's just something that I wanted to bring up to you guys. And I really appreciate my time here and getting to meet some of you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking the time to come here. So that wraps up the translocation session. Um, Christina, if you wanna. And I just wanted to um, kind of reciprocate and thank all the tribal folks for coming here today and the tribal elders. I really appreciate it, and we really appreciate gaining the wisdom that you all have from your experience and um, sharing that with us so we can use that in the future. Thank you.
Thank you, Kelly. Okay, um, we have uh, reached the end of the the uh, program, and thanks for being flexible this morning with um, not having a break. And this was really, really productive information. So thank you uh, so much for this morning's session. So I just want to just I have just a short list of things that I want to go through in the last five minutes, or about five or so minutes that we have. Um, are there any final questions that people want to ask? Is there anybody that you didn't get a chance to ask a question to? Um, now, I just want to know, is there going to be like a, a list of uh, contacts that people can reach out to that you guys would provide? Yes, so that was on my list. So, yeah. So the question was, is there going to be a list of contacts that we can provide? And yes. So we have sign-in sheets um, from, uh, from all three days. And I, we, I will um, put those, type those lists up and put those together. Um, and if there's some, you know, if somebody doesn't want to be on that distribution list, please let me know. Um, but otherwise I'll make, you know, it's just name and agency and email address. So I can make those contacts available. Yeah, thing too, the people want to know, uh, are they going to do this contact Brian or John uh, for Christian for all four tribes and everything? And I think they've... Uh, So we, yeah, so, and this will be, um, thank you for that comment. He was just reiterating that we should have this, you know, get together as often as we can and have this, you know, type of meeting more than once a year. So the Lamprey Technical Work Group um, that, you know, pr primarily organized this does get together um, twice a year in person and then the subgroups get together um, multiple times each year. But for this sort of information sharing with people that are coming in from outside the Lamprey Technical Work Group, um, I agree that this is really important information, and we do plan on doing this now, at least on an annual basis, and having different topics. We're not going to have these same, you know, focal topics each time. Um, the planning committee, who I'm going to acknowledge in a second, um, came together and talked about what topics would be um, important to have now this year, based on the work that the subgroups of the Lamprey Technical Work Group are currently working on. But there's a lot of other topics that we have, like um, dredging and more information on juvenile entrainment. And we're starting a restoration um, subgroup, which is something that several people brought up and how lamprey are affected by salmonid restoration um, and really doing, you know, kicking off um, an accounting of how these projects are affecting lamprey. So that's going to be a subgroup that's coming up. So I anticipate the next meeting that we have like this will have some different, um, some different focal topics. And it sounds like the speed presentation section was fairly well received too, and there's that's always a good way to throw in some uh, emerging information too that might not fall into one of those bigger, into those bigger sections. Um, but I, so please contact me, I'm the chairperson of the Lamprey Technical Work Group. I'm always happy to provide information on what the Lamprey Technical Work Group is doing. Um, people are welcome to be a part of that group. Uh, if you'd like, I can give you more information about it through the website that we are, that um, Aaron talked about yesterday, there will be a, there's right now in development, there is um, a page specifically for the Lamprey Technical Work Group that will have all the members, their expertise, their areas, the subgroups, what they're studying. So that information, um, that website is under development currently and should be done in the next um, two months. So, um, so anyway, so as far as materials that will be available, we're going to make the presentations available from this meeting so people can have those to look at. I forgot to ask, is there anybody from Washington? Washington? There were yesterday, uh, Bruce. One of the things that I'd like to know, you know, we used to get the eels at a place called Rainbow Falls. I think it's up there by uh, uh, Chehalis someplace. 
And I was just wondering what's the status of that place anymore. They, they never hear. They haven't gone back to for ages. And, and I don't know if, this, if people still get a lamprey there. Or, or what's the status on that? And believe it or not, I was asking by somebody from Oakville. You guys ever come back and gather eels anymore? And I said, I don't even know if there's any eels up there. Uh, Bruce, I, um, I can answer part of the question. They, they did um, some eDNA studies recently, um, and they found that Pacific Lamprey are pretty widespread from the lower to upper uh, reaches of Chehalis, and um, I, I don't think they're doing any adult uh, harvesting, or um, uh, not that I know of, um, but, but I think they're really the tribes that are interested in bringing that back, culture back, and and uh, so they're trying, looking into what they can do, and they're finding that Pacific Lamp Bay are, are um, all over their place. <coughs> they're finding good news. Well, the only reason I'm asking is because uh, last year, we were up at a convention or something like that, and then a guy approached me and was asking me about eels and, uh, you know, where you can get some fresh eels and stuff. And then uh, we were talking about, I, I haven't mentioned that. to do summarize um i was supposed to summarize bruce's question first um it, it was about you know the status of pacific lamprey and chihalis and rainbow falls and um and you mentioned you know the importance of those harvest sites and how we really need to um kind of learn more about uh, the status there and and what can be done there and and i, I think chihalis tribes are they, they came to our hatchery and they're really interested in doing more for Lamprey, and I think they're going to be um, ha having more projects uh, coming up. So, yeah, it'd be great to get a um, summary from them next year for, at this event about what they're doing. So, yeah, thanks for your so. Yeah, well, well, one of the things there, too, is we need to to teach uh, the tribes that have lost it, like the California tribes. And I was just explaining to Kelly what the, the dried eel, what its role it is. The eel tail was our teething. And, and things like that we need to learn and pass it on to them. As the dried eel tail would uh, soothe the gums from the oil as the, as, uh, because I went through it when I was a baby. That's what my mother said. Here's your, here's your teething ring when I was older. And, and it does, and, the, and that oil would soothe the gums, and the babies wouldn't be cranky like uh, now. So there's a lot of people don't understand what uh, all of these animals do in, in our life, the salmon, the eel, all of those, what they provide for us. So that we need to regain that and, and teach it to them because she didn't know and I'm glad I was able to tell her. So uh, 
personal experience because that's what my teeth came through on. <laughs> so I think it's a, that brings up a really um, good point that Bruce had, an, an idea of having this meeting at a, at a tribal location that we can do that. And perfect opportunity is Kelly's going to have a new baby, and so she can bring the baby with her and, and be the, <laughs> the test case. Exactly. Give me some lamprey tail for this child. To Crying, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll keep you up to date on, on plans for the for the next meeting like this. Um, but the other materials that will be available, uh, the presentations, definitely the ID guides that Ralph Lampman brought, um, the restoration guide that John Crandall talked about, um, the attendance list, so all of those materials will make available uh, from us. Let me know if I forget uh, if I've forgotten about something. Um, so I just want to thank um, everybody for coming yesterday and today, um, and if you were here on Tuesday as well. Um, a special thank you to the speakers who um, gave us such good information and, and took a lot of time to prepare their presentations and, and um, participate on the panel discussions and ask questions. And thanks participants for asking a lot of good questions too. I think it was a really good information exchange, which is what the, the goal of this was. So um, and thank you to the committee, had a really, um, uh, Hard-working committee, obviously. Um, Brian McElraith, thank you, and thank you also for organizing the space. This is always such a great space to have, and all the, you know, the logistics and the coffee and the water. <laughs> we have to be thankful for those for those things, as we know, since we, anyway. Um, uh, Dave Ward, thank you very much for all the planning. Um, Ann Groda, also Bob Rose, Ralph Lampman, Kelly Coates. Uh, and Artie Nelly, um, that was the, the planning committee for this, for this technical uh, yesterday and today. So thank you so much uh, to those people. Please send me feedback. Um, if there's any feedback that people want to give now, that's fine. Otherwise, please email me. Please email Bob Rose. Um, you can also send feedback to that, uh, the, the e email that you RSVP'd to, the Lamprey meeting December 2017 would also be a good place to provide feedback if you have any ideas or suggestions on how we might improve this meeting uh, next year. So, anybody have any final comments they want to make before we send everybody on their on their way? Christina, um, we got word from the you know, California guys, about, uh, <coughs> we got from the California guys about uh, uh, Lamprey Passage meeting. <coughs> I think one was held, and it sounded to me like um, there is going to be a continuation of that. So. Maybe kind of, if you might already have it, but notices of that kind of stuff on that web page yes. would be valuable. Yes, and that, that's the intention, Dave, for sure, is to have um, on the website, the Fish and Wildlife Service um, Conservation Initiative website, is to have um, upcoming events. And so that, again, we hope that the Data Clearinghouse and that will really be a place that people can look for all of this information. Uh, so that's the intention. Okay, thank you, everybody, and safe travels. <laughs>